Chapter 5 of Where We Got the Bible Our Debt to the Catholic Church. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Where We Got the Bible Our Debt to the Catholic Church by Rev. Henry Graham. Chapter 5 Deficiencies of the Protestant Bible. Item 1. The point that we have arrived at now, if you remember, is this. The Catholic Church, through her popes and councils, gathered together the separate books that Christians venerated, which existed in different parts of the world, sifted the chaff from the wheat, the false from the genuine, decisively and finally formed a collection, i.e., drew up a list or catalogue of inspired and apostolical writings into which no other book should ever be admitted, and declared that these, and these only, were the sacred scriptures of the New Testament. The authorities that were mainly responsible for thus settling and closing the canon of Holy Scripture were the councils of Hippo and of Carthage in the 4th century, under the influence of St. Augustine, at the latter of which two legates were present from the Pope, and the Popes Innocent I in 405 and Gelasius in 494, both of whom issued lists of sacred scripture identical with that fixed by the councils. From that date, all through the centuries, this was the Christian's Bible. The Church never admitted any other and at the Council of Florence in the 15th century, and the Council of Trent in the 16th, and the Council of the Vatican in the 19th, she renewed her anathemas against all who should deny or dispute this collection of books as the inspired word of God. Item 2. What follows from this is self-evident. The same authority which made and collected and preserved these books, alone has the right to claim them as her own, and to say what the meaning of them is. The Church of St. Paul, and St. Peter, and St. James, in the first century, was the same church as that of the Council of Carthage and St. Augustine in the fourth, and of the Council of Florence in the fifteenth, and the Vatican in the nineteenth, one and the same body, growing and developing certainly, as every living thing must do, but still preserving its identity, and remaining essentially the same body, as a man of eighty is the same person as he was at forty, and the same person at forty as he was at two. The Catholic Church of today, then, may be compared to a man who has grown from infancy to youth, and from youth to middle age. Suppose a man wrote a letter setting forth certain statements. Whom would you naturally ask to tell what the meaning of these statements was? Surely the man that wrote it. The Church wrote the New Testament. She, and she alone, can tell us what the meaning of it is. Again, the Catholic Church is like a person who was present at the side of our blessed Lord when he walked and talked in Galilee and Judea. Suppose, for a moment, that that man was gifted with perpetual youth. This, by the way, is an illustration of W. H. Malloch's Doctrine and Doctrinal Disruption, Chapter 11. And also with perfect memory and heard all the teaching and explanations of our Redeemer and of his apostles, and retained them. He would be an invaluable witness and authority to consult, surely, so as to discover exactly what was the doctrine of Jesus Christ and of the Twelve. But such undoubtedly is the Catholic Church, not an individual person, but a corporate personality who lived with indeed was called into being by our divine Saviour, in whose hearing he uttered all his teaching, who listened to the apostles in their day and generation, repeating and expounding the Saviour's doctrine, who, ever young and ever strong, 
has persisted and lived all through the centuries and continues even till our own day fresh and keen in memory as ever and able to assure us without fear of forgetting or mixing things up or adding things out of his own head what exactly our blessed lord said and taught and meant and did suppose again the man we are imagining had written down much of what he heard christ and the apostles say but had not fully reported all and was able to supplement what was lacking by personal explanations which he gave from his perfect memory that again is a figure of the catholic church she wrote down much indeed and most important parts of our lord's teaching and of the apostolic explanation of it in scripture but nevertheless she did not intend it to be a complete and exhaustive account apart from her own explanation of it and as a matter of fact she is able from her own perpetual memory to give fuller and clearer accounts and to add some things that are either omitted from the written report or are only hinted at or partially recorded or mentioned merely in passing such is the catholic church in relation to her own book the new testament it is hers because she wrote it by her first apostles and preserved it and guarded it all down the ages by her popes and bishops nobody else has any right to it whatsoever any more than a stranger has the right to come into your house and break open your desk and pilfer your private documents therefore i say that for protestants to step in fifteen hundred years after the catholic church had had possession of the bible and to pretend that it is theirs and that they alone know what the meaning of it is and that the scriptures alone without the voice of the catholic church explaining them are intended by god to be the guide and rule of faith this i say is the height of absurdity only those who are abysmally ignorant of the history of the sacred scriptures their origin and authorship and preservation could pretend that there is any logic or common sense in such a mode of acting but the absurdity becomes tenfold worse when it is remembered that the protestants did not appropriate the whole of the catholic books but actually cast out some from the collection and took what remained and elevated these into a new canon or volume of sacred scripture such as had never been seen or heard of before from the first to the sixteenth century in any church either in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters under the earth let us make good this charge item three open a protestant bible and you will find there are seven complete books a-wanting that is seven books fewer than there are in the catholic bible and seven fewer than there were in every collection and catalogue of holy scripture from the fourth to the sixteenth century their names are tobias baruch judith wisdom ecclesiasticus first maccabees second maccabees together with seven chapters of the book of esther and sixty-six verses of the third chapter of daniel commonly called the song of the three children daniel chapter three verses twenty four through ninety douay version these were deliberately cut out and the bible bound up without them the criticisms and remarks of luther calvin and the swiss and german reformers about these seven books of the old testament show to what depths of impiety those unhappy men had allowed themselves to fall when they broke away from the true church even in regard to the new testament it required all the powers of resistance on the part of the more conservative reformers to prevent luther from flinging out the epistle of st james as unworthy to remain within the volume of holy scripture an epistle of straw he called it with no character of the gospel in it in the same way and almost to the same degree he dishonored the epistle of st jude and the epistle to the hebrews 
and the beautiful apocalypse of st john declaring they were not on the same footing as the rest of the books and did not contain the same amount of gospel i e his gospel the presumptuous way indeed in which luther among others poured contempt and doubt upon some of the inspired writings which had been acknowledged and cherished and venerated for one thousand or twelve hundred years would be scarcely credible were it not that we have his very words in cold print which cannot lie and may be read in his biography or be seen quoted in such books as dr westcott's the bible in the church and why did he impugn such books as we have mentioned because they did not suit his new doctrines and opinions he had arrived at the principle of private judgment of picking and choosing religious doctrines and whenever any book such as the book of maccabees taught a doctrine that was repugnant to his individual taste as for example that it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins second maccabees chapter twelve verse forty six well so much the worse for the book throw it overboard was his sentence and overboard it went this is the protestant principle and it was the same with passages and texts in those books which luther allowed to remain and pronounced to be worthy to find a place within the boards of the new reformed bible in short he not only flung out certain books but he mutilated some that were left for example not pleased with st paul's doctrine we are justified by faith and fearing lest good works a popish superstition might creep in he added the word only after st paul's words making the sentence run we are justified by faith only and so it reads in lutheran bibles to this day a fact such as that is surely enough to make a bible christian turn pale it does not surprise a catholic at all but what does surprise us is the audacity of the man that could coolly change by a stroke of the pen a fundamental doctrine of the apostle of god st paul who wrote as all admitted under the inspiration of the holy ghost but this was the outcome of the protestant standpoint individual judgment no authority outside of oneself however ignorant however stupid however unlettered you may indeed you are bound to cut and carve out a bible and a religion for yourself no pope no council no church shall enlighten you or dictate or hand down the doctrines of christ and the result we have seen in the corruption of god's holy word item four yet in spite of all reviling of the roman church the reformers were bound to accept from her those sacred scriptures which they retained in their collection whatever bible they have to-day disfigured as it is was taken from us blind and bigoted indeed must be the evangelical christian who cannot recognize in the old catholic bible the quarry from which he has hewn the testament he loves and studies but with what a loss at what a sacrifice in what a crude and mutilated and disfigured condition that the reformers should appropriate unabridged the bible of the catholic church which was the only volume of god's scripture ever known on earth even for the purpose of elevating it into a false position this we could have understood what does make us shudder is their deliberate excision from that sacred volume of some of the inspired books which had god for their author and their no less deliberate alteration of some of the texts of those books that were suffered to remain it is on consideration of such points as these that pious persons outside the catholic fold would do well to ask themselves the question which christian body really loves and reveres the scriptures most which has proved 
by its actions its love and veneration and which seems most likely to incur the anathema recorded by st john that god will send upon those who shall take away from the words of the book of life apocalypse chapter twenty two verse nineteen end of chapter five chapter six of where we got the bible our debt to the catholic church this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. where we got the bible our debt to the catholic church by rev henry graham chapter six the originals and their disappearance part one now you may naturally enough ask me but how do you know all this where has the bible come from have you got the original writings that came from the hand of moses or paul or john no none of it not a scrap or a letter but we know from history and tradition that these were the books they wrote and they have been handed down to us in a most wonderful way what we have now is the printed bible but before the invention of printing in fourteen hundred and fifty the bible existed only in handwriting what we call manuscript and we have in our possession now copies of the bible in manuscript which were made as early as the fourth century and these copies which you can see with your own eyes at this day contain the books which the catholic bible contains today and that is how we know we are right in receiving these books as scripture as genuinely the work of the apostles and evangelists why is it that we have not the originals written by st john and st paul and the rest well there are several reasons to account for the disappearance of the originals item one the persecutors of the church for the first three hundred years of christianity destroyed everything christian that they could lay their hands on over and over again barbarous pagans burst in upon christian cities and villages and churches and burned all the sacred things they could find and not only so but they especially compelled christians as we saw before to deliver up their sacred books under pain of death and then consigned them to the flames among these doubtless some of the writings that came from the hand of the apostle and evangelist perished item two again we must remember the material which the inspired authors used for writing their gospels and epistles was very easily destroyed it was perishable to a degree it was called papyrus i shall explain what it was made of in a moment very frail and brittle and not made to last to any great age and its delicate quality no doubt accounts for the loss of some of the choicest treasures of ancient literature as well as of the original handwriting of the new testament writers we know of no manuscript of the new testament existing now which is written on papyrus item three furthermore when in various churches throughout the first centuries copies were made of the inspired writings there was not the same necessity for preserving the originals the first christians had no superstitious or idolatrous veneration for the sacred scriptures such as seems to prevail among protestants today they did not consider it necessary for salvation that the very handwriting of st paul or st matthew should be preserved inspired by god though these men were they had the living infallible church to teach and guide them by the mouth of her popes and bishops and to teach them not only all that could be found in the sacred scriptures but the true meaning of it as well 
so that we need not be surprised that they were content with mere copies of the original works of the inspired writers so soon as a more beautiful or correct copy was made an earlier and rougher one was simply allowed to perish there is nothing strange or unusual in all this it is just what holds good in the secular world we do not doubt the terms or provisions of the magna carta because we have not seen the original a copy if we are sure it is correct is good enough for us part two well then the originals as they came from the hand of apostle and evangelist have totally disappeared this is what infidels and skeptics taunt us with and cast in our teeth you cannot produce they say the handwriting of those from whom you derive your religion neither the founder nor his apostles your gospels and epistles are a fraud they were not written by these men at all but are the invention of a later age and consequently we cannot depend upon the contents of them or believe what they tell us about jesus christ now of course these attacks fall harmlessly upon us catholics because we do not profess to rest our religion upon the bible alone and are independent of it and would be just as we are and what we are though there were no bible at all it is the protestants who have staked their very existence upon that book and must stand or fall with it that are called upon to defend themselves against the critics but i shall only remark here that the argument of infidel and skeptic would if logically applied discredit not only the bible but many other books which they themselves accept and believe without hesitation there is far more evidence for the bible than there is for certain books of classical antiquity which no one dreams of disputing there are for example only fifteen manuscripts of the works of herodotus and none earlier than the tenth century a d yet he lived four hundred years before christ the oldest manuscript of the works of thucydides is of the eleventh century a d yet he flourished and wrote more than four hundred years before christ shall we say then i want to see the handwriting of thucydides and herodotus else i shall not believe these are their genuine works you have no copy of their writings near the time they lived none indeed till fourteen hundred years after them they must be a fraud and a forgery scholars with no religion at all would say we were fit for an asylum if we took up that position yet it would be a far more reasonable attitude than that which they take up towards the bible why because there are known to have been many thousand copies of the testament in existence by the third century i e only a century or two after st john and we know for certain that there are three thousand existing at the present day ranging from the fourth century downwards the fact is the wealth of evidence for the genuineness of the new testament is simply stupendous and in comparison with many ancient histories which are received without question on the authority of late and few and bad copies the sacred volume is founded on a rock but let us pass on enough for us to know that god has willed that the handiwork of every inspired writer from moses down to st john should have perished from amongst men and that he has entrusted our salvation to something more stable and enduring than a dead book or an undecipherable manuscript that is the living and infallible church of christ ubi ecclesia ibi christus now i wish to devote what remains of this chapter to say something about the material instruments that were used for the writing and transmission of holy scriptures in the earliest days and a brief review of the materials employed 
and the dangers of loss and of corruption which necessarily accompanied the work will convince us more than ever of the absolute need of some divinely protected authority like the catholic church to guard the gospel from error and destruction and preserve the apostolic deposit as it is called from sharing the fate which is liable to overtake all things that are as says st paul contained in earthen vessels part three various materials were used in ancient times for writing as e g stone pottery bark of trees leather and clay tablets among the babylonians and egyptians item one but before christianity and for the first few ages of our era papyrus was used which has given its name to our paper it was formed of the bark of the reed or bulrush which once grew plentifully on the nile banks first split into layers it was then glued by overlapping the edges and another layer glued to this at right angles to prevent splitting and after sizing and drying it formed a suitable writing surface thousands of rolls of papyrus have been found in egyptian and babylonian tombs and beneath the buried city of herculaneum owing their preservation probably to the very fact of being buried because as i said the substance was very brittle frail and perishable and unsuited for rough usage though probably many copies of the bible were originally written on this papyrus and most likely the inspired writers used it themselves none have survived the wreck of ages it is this material st john is referring to when he says to his correspondent in the second epistle verse twelve having more things to write to you i would not by paper and ink item two when in the course of time papyrus fell into comparative disuse from its unsuitableness and fragility the skins of animals came to be used this material had two names if it was made out of the skin of sheep or goats it was called parchment if made of the skin of delicate young calves it was called vellum vellum was used in earlier days but being very dear and hard to obtain gave place to a large extent to the coarser parchment st paul speaks about this stuff when he tells st timothy second timothy chapter four verse thirteen to bring the books but especially the parchments most of the new testament manuscripts which we possess today are written on this material a curious consequence of the costliness of this substance was this that the same sheet of vellum was made to do duty twice over and became what is termed a palimpsest which means rubbed again a scribe say of the tenth century unable to purchase a new supply of vellum would take a sheet containing perhaps a writing of the second century which had become worn out through age and difficult to decipher he would wash or scrape out the old ink and use the surface over again for copying out some other work in which the living generation felt more interest it goes without saying that in many cases the writing thus blotted out was of far greater value than that which replaced it indeed some of the most precious monuments of sacred learning are of this description and they were discovered in this way the process of erasing or sponging out the ancient ink was seldom so perfectly done as to prevent all traces of it still remaining and some strokes of the older hand might often be seen peeping out beneath the more modern writing in eighteen thirty four some chemical mixture was discovered which was applied with much success and had the effect of restoring the faded lines and letters of those venerable records cardinal mai a man of colossal scholarship and untiring industry and a member of the sacred college in rome under pope gregory the sixteenth was a perfect expert in this branch of research 
and by his ceaseless labors and ferret-like hunts in the vatican library brought to light some remarkable old manuscripts and some priceless works of antiquity among these all students have to thank him for restoring a long-lost work of cicero de republica which was known to have existed previously and which the cardinal unearthed from beneath st augustine's commentary on the psalms the most important manuscript of the new testament of this description is called the codex of ephraim about two hundred years ago it was noticed that this curious-looking vellum all soiled and stained and hitherto thought to contain only the theological discourses of st ephraim an old syrian father was showing dim traces and faint lines of some older writing beneath the chemical mixture was applied and lo what should appear but a most ancient and valuable copy of holy scriptures of handwriting no later than the fifth century this had been coolly scrubbed out by some impecunious scribe of the twelfth century to make room for his favorite work the discourses of saint ephraim let us charitably hope that the good monk as he probably was did not know what he was scrubbing out at all events it was brought into france by queen catherine de medici and is now safely preserved in the royal library at paris containing on the same page two works one written on top of the other with a period of seven hundred years between them i have told you about the sheets used by the earliest writers of the new testament what kind of pen and ink had they item one well for the brittle papyrus a reed was used much the same as that still in use in the east but of course for writing on hard tough parchment or vellum a metal pen or stylus was required it is to this st john refers in his third epistle verse thirteen when he says i had many things to write unto thee but i would not by ink and pen write to thee the strokes of these pens may still be seen quite clearly impressed on the parchment even though all trace of the ink has utterly vanished besides this a bodkin or needle was employed by means of which along with a ruler a blank leaf or sheet was carefully divided into columns and lines and on nearly all the manuscripts these lines and marks may still be seen sometimes so firmly and deeply drawn that those on one side of the leaf have penetrated through to the other side without however cutting the vellum item two the ink used was a composition of soot or lamp black or burnt shavings of ivory mixed with gum or wine lees or alum for all these elements entered into it in most ancient manuscripts unfortunately the ink has for the most part turned red or brown or become very pale or peeled off or eaten through the vellum and in many cases later hands have ruthlessly retraced the ancient letters making the original writing look much coarser but we know that many colored inks were used such as red green blue or purple and they are often quite brilliant to this day item three as to the shape of the manuscripts the oldest form was that of a roll they were generally fixed on two rollers so that the part read for example in public worship could be wound out of sight and a new portion brought to view this was the kind of thing that was handed to our lord when he went into the synagogue at nazareth on the sabbath he unfolded the book and read and then when he had folded the book he handed it to the minister st luke chapter four verses seventeen through twenty when not in use these rolls were kept in round boxes or cylinders and sometimes in cases of silver or cloth of great value the leaves of parchment were sometimes of considerable size 
such as folio but generally the shape was what we know as quarto or small folio and some were octavo the skin of one animal especially if an antelope could furnish many sheets of parchment but if the animal was a small calf then its skin could only furnish very few sheets and an instance of this is the manuscript called the sinaitic now in st petersburg whose sheets are so large that the skin of a single animal believed to have been the youngest and finest antelope could only provide two sheets eight pages item four the page was divided into two or three or four columns though the latter is very rare the writing was of two distinct kinds one called uncho meaning an inch consisting entirely of capital letters with no connection between the letters and no space between words at all the other style which is later was cursive that is a running hand like our ordinary handwriting with capitals only at the beginning of sentences and in this case the letters are joined together and there is a space between words the unshall style consisting of capitals only was prevalent for the first three centuries of our era in the fourth century the cursive began and continued till the invention of printing item five originally i need hardly say there was no such thing in the manuscripts as divisions into chapters and verses and no points or full stops or commas to let you know where one sentence began and the next finished hence the reading of one of these ancient records is a matter of some difficulty to the unscholarly the division into chapters so familiar to us in our modern bibles was the invention of cardinal hugo a dominican in twelve hundred and forty eight and it is no calumny upon the reputation of that great man to say that a very bad job he made of it there seems to be literally neither rhyme nor reason in his method of splitting up the page of scripture the chapters are of very unequal length and frequently interrupt a narrative or argument or an incident in the most arbitrary way as any one may see for himself by looking up such passages as acts chapter twenty one verse forty or acts chapters four and five or first corinthians chapters twelve and thirteen the division again into verses was the work of one robert stephens and first appeared in the geneva bible fifteen hundred and sixty this gentleman seems to have completed his performance on a journey between paris and lyon inter equitandum as the latin biographer phrases it probably while stopping overnights in inns and hostels i think an old commentator quaintly remarks it had been better done on his knees in the closet to this i would venture to add that his achievement must be put on the same level and share the same criticism as that of cardinal hugo item six the manuscripts of the bible as i before remarked now known to be in existence number about three thousand of which the vast majority are in running hand and hence are subsequent to the fourth century there are none of course later than the sixteenth century for then the book began to be printed and none have yet been found earlier than the fourth their age that is the precise century in which they were written it is not always easy to determine about the tenth century the scribes who copied them began to notify the date in a corner of the page but before that time we can only judge by various characteristics that appear in the manuscripts for example the more simple and upright and regular the letters are the less flourish and ornamentation they have about them the nearer equality there is between the height and breadth of the characters 
the more ancient we may be sure is the manuscript then of course we can often tell the age of a manuscript approximately at least by the kind of pictures the scribe had painted in it the illustrations he had introduced and the ornamenting of the first letter of a sentence or on the top of a page for we know in what century that particular style of illumination prevailed it would be impossible to give any one who had never seen any specimens of these wonderful old manuscripts a proper idea of their appearance or make him realize their unique beauty there they are to-day perfect marvels of human skill and workmanship manuscripts of every kind old parchments all stained and worn books of faded purple lettered with silver and their pages beautifully designed and ornamented bundles of finest vellum yellow with age and bright even yet with the gold and vermilion laid on by pious hands one thousand years ago in many shapes in many colors in many languages there they are scattered throughout the libraries and museums of europe challenging the admiration of every one that beholds them for the astonishing beauty clearness and regularity of their lettering and the incomparable illumination of their capitals and headings still at this day after so many centuries of change and chance charming the eye of all with their soft yet brilliant colors and defying our modern scribes to produce anything the least approaching them in loveliness there lie the sacred records hoary with age fragile slender time-worn bearing upon their front clear proofs of their ancient birth yet with the bloom of youth still clinging about them we simply stand and wonder and we also despair we speak glibly of the dark ages and despise their monks and friars and i shall with your leave speak a little more about them immediately but one thing at least is certain and that is that not in the wide world to-day could any of their critics find a craftsman to make a copy of holy scripture worthy to be compared for beauty clearness and finish with any one of the hundreds of copies produced in the convents and monasteries of medieval europe End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Where We Got the Bible Our Debt to the Catholic Church This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Where We Got the Bible Our Debt to the Catholic Church by Rev. Henry Graham Chapter 7 Variations in the Text Fatal to Protestant Theory I have mentioned monasteries, and justly so, for there is no doubt that the vast majority, indeed practically all of these venerable pages, were traced by the hand of some ecclesiastic the clergy were the only persons who had learning enough for it what care what zeal what loving labor was spent by these holy men in their work of transcribing the word of scripture we can judge by viewing their handiwork yet the work was necessarily very slow and liable to error and that errors did creep in we know from the simple fact that there are about two hundred thousand variations in the text of the Bible as written in these manuscripts that we have today. This is not to be wondered at if you remember that there are thirty five thousand verses in the Bible. Consider the various ways in which corruptions and variations could be introduced. The variations might have been a intentionally introduced or b unintentionally a 
under this class we must unfortunately reckon those changes which were made by heretics to suit their particular doctrine or practice just as for example the lutherans added the word only to st paul's words to fit in with their new-fangled notion about justification by faith only or again a scribe might really think that he was improving the old copy from which he was transcribing by putting in a word here or leaving out a word there or putting in a different word so as to make the sentence clearer or the sense better but b it is satisfactory to be assured as we are that the vast majority of changes and varieties of readings in these old manuscripts is entirely due to some unintentional cause one the scribe might be tired or sleepy or exhausted with much writing and might easily skip over a word or indeed a whole sentence or miss a line or repeat a line or make a mistake when he came to the end of a line or a sentence he might be interrupted in his work and begin at the wrong word when he recommenced or he might too have bad eyesight some lost it altogether through copying so much or not know really what was the proper division to make of the words he was copying especially if the copy he was busy with was one of the old uncials with no stops and no pauses and no division between words or sentences or he might if he were writing at the dictation of another not hear very well or pick up a word or phrase wrongly as for example the woman did when she wrote satan died here for a milliner's shop instead of satin died here or three he might actually embody and copy into the sacred text of the gospels words or notes or phrases which did not really belong to the gospel at all but had been written on the margin of the parchment by some previous scribe merely to explain things these glosses as they are called undoubtedly have crept in to some copies and the protestants are guilty of repeating one every time they say their form of the lord's prayer with its ending for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever amen such an addition was not uttered by our lord catholics consequently do not use it these are some and not all of the ways in which you can easily see that differences could arise in the various copies made by old scribes put six men today to report a speech by any orator there will be considerable variety in their reports as one can prove by comparing different newspaper accounts of the same speech any morning i do not say that the differences will always signify much or substantially alter the speaker's meaning yet there they are and sometimes they may be serious enough and if these things happen daily even now with all our advanced and highly developed methods of printing how much more would they happen in the old days before printing when hand and brain and eyesight and hearing could make so many blunders one single letter changed would conceivably reverse the meaning of the whole sentence i shall not alarm you by flaunting specimens from the greek or hebrew but shall make plain enough what i mean by recording an instance occurring in our own days in our own tongue an old provost of a certain east lothian town had died and had been duly buried and a headstone had been erected bearing the fitting inscription from st paul's first epistle to the corinthians chapter fifteen verse fifty two we shall all be changed it was finished on the saturday but a deed of darkness was done before the sabbath morning the minister had a son who loved a practical joke they say ministers sons are the worst i am one he got accomplices for his shameful deed they hoisted him up and in cold blood he took putty and obliterated the letter c in changed 
on the sabbath the godly passing around with long faces bibles and white handkerchiefs to view the old provost's tombstone learned for the first time that the apostle taught we shall all be hanged you see what i mean well the bibles before printing are full of varieties and differences and blunders which of them all is correct pious protestants may hold up their hands in horror and cry out there are no mistakes in the bible it is all inspired it is god's own book quite true if you get god's own book the originals as they came from the hand of apostle prophet and evangelist these and these men only were inspired and protected from making mistakes but god never promised that every individual scribe perhaps sleepy-headed or stupid or heretical who took in hand the copying out of the new testament would be infallibly secure from committing errors in his work the original scripture is free from error because it has god for its author so teaches the catholic church and the catholic bible too the vulgate is a correct version of the scripture but that does not alter the fact that there are scores nay thousands of differences in the old manuscripts and copies of the bible that were written before the days of printing and i should like any inquiring protestants to ponder over this fact and see how they can possibly reconcile it with their principle that the bible alone is the all-sufficient guide to salvation which bible are you sure you have got the right bible are you certain that your bible contains exactly the words and all the words and only the words that came from the hands of apostle and evangelist are you sure that no other words have crept in or that none have been dropped out can you study the hebrew and greek and latin manuscripts and versions page by page and compare them and compile for yourself a copy of holy scripture identical with that written by the inspired authors from moses to saint john if you cannot and you see at once that it is impossible do not talk to me about the bible and the bible only you know perfectly well that you must trust to some authority outside of yourself to give you the bible the bible you are using today was handed down to you you have in fact allowed some third party to come between you and god a thing quite repugnant to the protestant theory we catholics on the other hand glory in having some third party to come between us and god because god himself has given it to us namely the catholic church to teach us and lead us to him we believe in the bible interpreted for us by that church because god entrusted to her the bible as part of his word and gave her a promise that she would never err in telling us what it means and explaining to us the many things hard to be understood which saint peter tells us are to be found within it though there were as many million variations as there are thousands in the different copies of the bible we should still be unmoved for we have a teacher sent from god above and independent of all scripture who assisted by the holy ghost speaks with divine authority and whose voice to us is the voice of god it matters not to us when a christian may have lived on earth whether before any of the new testament was written at all or before it was collected into one volume or before it was printed or after it has been printed no matter to us whether there are one thousand or one million variations in texts and passages and chapters of ancient copies out of which our modern bibles are compiled we do not hazard our salvation on such a precarious and unreliable support we rather take that guide who is the same yesterday and today and forever and who speaks to us with a living voice and who can never make a mistake 
who is never uncertain or doubtful or wavering in her utterances never denying to-day what she affirmed yesterday but ever clear definite dogmatic enlightening what is dark and making plain what is obscure to the minds of men this is the catholic church established by almighty god as his organ and mouthpiece and interpreter unaffected by the changes and unshaken by the discoveries of ages to her we listen her we obey to her we submit our judgment and our intellect knowing she will never lead us wrong in her we find peace and comfort satisfaction and solution of all our difficulties for she is the one infallible teacher and guide appointed by god this is a logical consistent clear and intelligible method of attaining and preserving the truth a perfect plan and scheme of christianity it is the catholic plan it is christ's plan what plan have protestants to substitute for it that can stand a moment's analysis at the bar of reason history common sense or even of holy scripture itself end of chapter seven Chapter 15 of Where We Got the Bible, Our Debt to the Catholic Church. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Where We Got the Bible, Our Debt to the Catholic Church by the Reverend Henry Graham. Chapter 15. The Catholic's Bible. What was the Catholic Church doing all this time? Well, she was in a state of persecution in England and could not do very much except suffer. One, many of her best sons went abroad to more favorable lands. The circumstances had assuredly been most unsuitable for bringing out a Catholic version of the scriptures. She was rather content indeed compelled to sit still, and from her majestic height looked down and watched the rise and fall, the publication and withdrawal, the appearance and disappearance of dozens of different versions heretical and corrupt grotesque in their blunders and vile in their sectarianism that had been issued by the various protestant bodies by the end of the sixteenth century no less than two hundred and seventy new sects had been enumerated and some that had been extinct for centuries like arianism revived under the genial influence of luther dr walton bishop of chester and author of the famous polyglot bible that bears his name laments this fact in his preface about the end of the seventeenth century there is no fanatic or clown says he from the lowest dregs of the people who does not give you his own dreams as the word of god for the bottomless pit seems to have been set open from whence a smoke has risen which has obscured the heavens and the stars and locusts are come out with wings a numerous race of sectaries and heretics who have renewed all the old heresies and invented monstrous opinions of their own these have filled our cities villages camps houses nay our churches and pulpits too and lead the poor deluded people with them to the pit of perdition doubtless the poor bishop being a self-complacent anglican failed to perceive that he himself was as much of a deluded sectary and heretic as any of them it was not till fifteen eighty two that a catholic new testament appeared and that was not in england but in france at rheims whence a colony of persecuted catholics had fled including Cardinal Allen, Gregory Martin, and Robert Bristow, who were mainly responsible for this new translation. William Allen, formerly canon of York, later Archbishop of Mechlin, and lastly Cardinal, had founded a college at Douay for the training of priests for the English mission in 1568. He was compelled to remove it to Rems in 1578, owing to Huguenot riots, and there, as I said, in 1582, they issued the new testament in english for catholics it was a translation of course from the latin vulgate which had been declared by the council of trent to be the authorized text of scripture for the church martin was the principal translator whilst bristow mainly contributed the notes which are powerful and illuminative the whole was intended to be of service both to priests and people to give them a true and sound rendering of the original writings to save them from the numberless false and incorrect versions in circulation and to provide them with something wherewith to refute the heretics who then as ever approached with a text in their mouth two 
needless to say the appearance of this new testament with its annotations at once aroused the fiercest opposition queen elizabeth ordered searchers to seek out and confiscate every copy they could find if a priest was found in possession of it he was forthwith imprisoned torture by rack was applied to those who circulated it and a scholar dr fulke was appointed to refute it all these measures be it noted kind reader were taken by parties who advocated loudly the unlimited right of private judgment in fifteen ninety three the college returned to douay and there in sixteen o nine the old testament was added and the catholic bible in english was complete and is called the douay bible complete we may well call it it is the only really complete bible in english for it contains those seven books of the old testament which i pointed out before were and are omitted by the protestants in their editions so that we can claim to have not only the pure unadulterated bible but the whole of it without addition or subtraction a translation of the vulgate which is itself the work of st jerome in the fourth century which again is the most authoritative and correct of all the early copies of holy scripture at a single leap we thus arrive at that great work completed by the greatest scholar of his day who had access to manuscripts and authorities that have now perished and who living so near the days of the apostles and as it were close to the very fountainhead was able to produce a copy of the inspired writings which for correctness can never be equalled our modern catholic bible owes its present form mainly to the revision of bishop chaloner died seventeen eighty one we may feel justly proud of our douay bible we need not declare it to be perfect in all respects either in regard to its english style or its employment of words from foreign languages we need not feel the less affection or admiration for it though we should suggest the possibility of revision and improvement in some particulars it has indeed been re-edited and revised ere now but when all is said and done it is a noble version with a noble history true honest scholarly faithful to the original the catholic church has nothing to regret in her policy or her action towards english versions of the scriptures she has not issued one version one year and cancelled it in the next because of its corruptions and errors its partisan notes or political doctrines nobly she has stood for reverence and caution in respect of translating god's holy word into the vulgar tongue she was slow in acting i admit if by slowness we mean deliberation and prudence for she saw with unerring vision the evils that were certain to result from a hasty casting of pearls before swine but when she did act she acted decisively and once for all who is there that has followed the sad story of the protestant treatment of the sacred scriptures but will be forced by contrast to admire the wisdom the calm dignity the consistent and deliberate policy of the ecclesiastical authorities of the catholic church in england which stands as a reproof to the violent blundering malicious methods of the sectaries in which if it had been acquiesced in by others would have saved the word of god from infinite degradation and contempt three hatred against her version of the bible when it first appeared was so deep that an oath sworn on it was not deemed to be valid it was on this sacred volume that mary queen of scots laid her hand and swore her innocence the night before her execution the earl of kent at once interposed with a remark that the book was a popish and false translation and in consequence the oath was of no value does your lordship suppose was the quiet answer of the noble queen that my oath would be the better if i swore on your translation which i do not believe thanks be to god the douay version has now so established its position and hatred to it and to its authors has so diminished that a catholic may even in these lands swear upon it in conscience and his word is believed as any other man's in a court of law found in thousands of pious catholic homes at the present hour we may comfort ourselves with the reflection that in a protestant kingdom and in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation even now there exists the true version of the gospel of our blessed lord and the inspired words of his holy apostles and evangelists as they have been handed down and preserved by the catholic church from the beginning unchangeable and unchanged and we may feel the most absolute certainty that as it is the true version so at a date not incalculably distant it will prove to be the only one for the others will have gone to join their predecessors and been consigned to a happy oblivion 
and only survive in the memory of him who glances at their musty corners and faded pages beneath the glass cases of library or museum. End of chapter 15